So today we're gonna we're gonna take a look at um, what constitutes a chemical bond. We're gonna go into more detail uh, than we've been accustomed to in the past. <clears throat> Uh, I will say that the the discussion of the chemical bond is so involved that it takes two chapters in this book. So I have I follow the chapters, and there'll be two exams on bonding. The first one uh, will be, and they're taken in roughly chronological order. In other words, bonding concepts developed over time, and then we're going to end up in chapter nine with the current understanding of what a chemical bond is. <clears throat> so, um, oh, and um, if you were here in person, not only would you get the handouts and the uh, crossword puzzle, but you'd also get the lab for next Tuesday. And I believe this is the this is the last yeah this is the last lab that we're going to do. It's a molar mass of a volatile compound. So we may have enough time to talk about it a little bit today. Uh, assuming I I'm not too long winded on the chapter. Okay. Uh, first question, of course, to consider is, what do we mean by the term chemical bond? Whenever You know, whenever you get into a discussion with somebody, you can tell pretty quick whether or not you're both on the same wavelength. In other words, uh, when I say this word, you understand what it means. Um, if the other side doesn't want to accept your definition of the terms, then you're never going to have an intelligent conversation with that person. So that's where I would start with definitions. What is a chemical bond? Uh, and we're going to discuss it in just a minute. Uh, and then we want to know, once we define the chemical bond, and actually at the same time, we're interested in why do atoms bond with each other to form compounds? Why don't we just have elements, right? Just the whole universe, just nothing but elements. Right? It'd be kind of a boring place then, of course, and we wouldn't be here. <clears throat> but we also want to know why atoms bond with one another, why separate uh, elements, separate atoms are not desirable. And then we'll look into the mechanics. How do atoms bond with each other to form compounds? And the... First place we're going to start, we're going to pick it up with Dalton's atomic theory. That's where the foundation was laid for the understanding of atoms. And then it uh, progressed from there. Um, of course, at that time, Dalton didn't explain. He, he wasn't able to explain, actually, um, anything about the association of one atom with another, the chemical bond. All right. Well, the bad news is there's no simple uh, definition for the chemical bond that is complete. There are lots of different um, definitions, and we probably ought to settle on at least a generalized definition of the chemical bond so we can, we've got some place to work from. We're going to expand upon the definition. And if we look at it in terms of purely physics, the chemical bond is the force that holds two atoms together. Um, and also makes them function as a single unit. One thing we do know, and this is this is evident through decades, centuries of investigation, scientific investigations, a bond will form if the energy of the combination of atoms, what we call the aggregate, 
is lower than that of the separated atoms. In other words, in a, a broader definition is that the universe tends toward lower energy, more stable situations. So, and if we apply that into in uh, specific terms to the formation of a chemical bond, if you can identify the energies of uh, these various atoms, they have a certain energy level. And then um, when you put them together, right, they're at a lower energy level, then it's very likely that the chemical bond will form. Because lower energy is desirable. It's more stable. All right. So if we look at this example, <clears throat> where you have, um, we know from example and experience that sodium and chlorine will react with one another and produce table salt, sodium chloride. Um, now, when this happens, um, actually, we're starting at the, the most simple interaction between atoms, electrostatic. When we have a positive ion and a negative ion, they're going to attract one another. And the closer they get together up to a certain point, then they're more stable. And we can measure the distance between the nuclei of the, the sodium and the chloride ions. And in, in this example, it's... 0.276 nanometers. They're, re they're relatively close. <clears throat> of course, we can't get the nuclei too close because the nuclei are positively charged and they'll repel. Right? So the overall charge of the ions draws them together. But once you start getting them close together, you get interactions of electrons repelling, get interaction of uh, positive charges from the nuclei interacting. So there's an ideal distance between the two ions, which is at their lowest energy. And if you try to push them any closer, then the energy cost goes up. <clears throat> and we can calculate the interaction using Coulomb's law. Right, there's Coulomb's law. And this is, is simply that the, the, the uh, energy between the two ions is this Coulomb's constant. See, I have to look it up all the time. Anyway. It's a 10 to the ninth. 19. 19. Minus 19. Minus 19 uh, joule nanometers. So that's a proportionality constant. We don't need to focus on that. What I want you to focus on is the charge of one ion and the charge of the second ion and then the distance between them. So as the charge goes up, the energy uh, between the two charged particles goes up. Now, if they're the same sign charge, then the energy goes up in a repulsive way. And if, the, if they're opposite signs, then as their charges, the relative charges go up, then there's more attractive force. There's more, um, and the energy term would be positive or negative depending on whether they're, they're two like charges or two opposite charges. And then the distance between them also has an influence on that energy level. So the closer they get together, the smaller this value, the higher the energy. Okay. <clears throat> so we can take these two uh, sodium and chloride ions, and we insert their charges, right? plus one, minus one, and then the distance between them. And of course, the units of measure have to be the same. So the, the distance between them is nanometers, nanometers cancel, and the energy then is left as joules. And the charge is dimensionless. So we find that the, the energy between them is a negative value and negative, more negative means um, more stable. And more negative means more uh -huh. stable. If they were both positive or both negative, you'd get a positive value. And the positive means repulsion. Negative means attraction. All right. Uh, 
let's see. So let's look at two hydrogen atoms now. Um, at this point, we were we we're discussing the um, essentially the ionic bond between two separate charges, two negative charges. Now let's look at what happens when we try to form a covalent bond where we put two like atoms together. This is the very simplest bond you can form between two hydrogen atoms. And to understand this type of bond, we also know that the covalent bond is one in which the electrons are shared. Right, we've established that already. So when these uh, two atoms approach one another, the first thing that they see is electrons. So the bonding is essentially an electronic process. Um, so as they get closer together, you see that these red dots are indicate the um, not individual electrons, but they represent electron density. So the more dots you have in a certain region, the more likely you are to find an electron there. So we find that once the H2 molecule is established, you have lots of red dots between them and very few outside that region on their axis between the two atoms. That's indicative of the formation of a covalent bond. Now there's a balance that has to be considered here, the balance between repulsive and attractive forces. You've got two protons, one from each atom, and you've got two electrons. And electrostatically, they tend to, the protons tend to uh, repel and the electrons tend to repel, but the protons and the electrons then will be attracted to one another. So there's a balance. You can get it only so close and you can't get them any closer. There's an ideal distance, what we call the bond length. Now this, this graph represents, uh, it's best to, to follow this graph, not from left to right as we normally would, but from right to left, because from the right side, you have two individual hydrogen atoms. And the distance between them is on the x-axis. So as we move to the left, they're getting closer and closer and closer. And we find as they get closer, the energy potential drops. Right? So they're getting closer and closer, and they reach an ideal, a minimum, in the, their energy when they get within 0 0.074 nanometers between the two. Then when you try to push them any closer, the energy goes up really fast. And um, uh, so they're going to find up form bond that's 0.074 nanometers in length. And uh, if we try to push them any closer, now we're trying to we're trying to get out of chemistry. Now we're going into nuclear physics because when you get them close enough, then another force takes over the strong nuclear charge. And that's where the two hydrogens fuse into helium and they give off a bunch of energy. Right? So that's not chemistry anymore. <clears throat> Although there's a middle ground between nuclear physics and chemistry, it's nuclear chemistry. So chemists are involved in nuclear energy. It's just that the process is no longer the formation of a chemical bond. It's, it's a, a fusion of nuclei. But notice it takes a whole lot of energy to get there. It's a massive amount of energy. That's why in nature, it only happens in the center of a star under huge pressures and high temperatures. Got to have lots of energy to drive them together in order for that strong nuclear force to take over. Okay, so we have an ideal distance for um, the formation of this particular bond. Okay. All right, just, this is just a reminder. When we form an ionic bond, electrons have to be transferred from one species to another. Then the attraction is purely electrostatic. Or the covalent bond where you have uh, two atoms that don't have enough electron negativity where they can steal an electron, one or more electrons from the other body, from the other atom, and form the complete charge. So then instead, they share electrons. And there are intermediate cases. 
Um, I may have said this before, but you've got um, uh, purely ionic bonding and purely covalent bonding. And most bonds, not all, but most, are on a continuum between them. They have a certain percentage covalent character and a certain percentage ionic character. The only time you'll have a purely covalent bond is when both atoms are exactly the same element, like dioxygen, dinitrogen, dichlorine, difluorine, all the diatomic elements. And purely ionic would be um, a metal with the very lowest electronegativity and a non-metal with the very highest electronegativity. So, and even then it wouldn't be purely ionic. Say cesium and fluorine. Right. Cesium has very low, fluorine has very high electronegativity. So you get uh, as pure a covalent bond, I mean, an ionic bond as possible out of those two. Okay. The nonpolar covalent bond would be on this end. We have talked about that, haven't we? Polarity of bonds. Oh, maybe we have. Okay, we're going to talk about it now. <laughs> when we talk about polarity, think of a uh, magnet. Right? You have a North Pole and a South Pole. Only in uh, in bonds and in whole molecules, you have um, a slightly positive charge and a slightly negative charge. It's not a complete charge. That would be an ionic bond. But even on this end of the scale, you can have a bond between two between two atoms, where one of them, this would be the anion, would have a stronger pull for electrons and give you a slightly negative side, and this would be a slightly positive side. That's our notation. The a small delta with a negative is slightly negative, slightly positive. That's so we don't get it confused with ionic, uh, with ions. Um, so this purely non nonpolar covalent would be the perfect example is the diatomic elements, where there's an equal sharing of electrons. And there's no charge separation in the bond. Now, of course, uh, actually, that's not the way I drew it there was not exactly right. It's going to be on this side. These need to be um, actually. Let me be consistent. Both of them are non-metals. The polar covalent bond then would be formed between uh, two atoms. Doesn't have to be a metal, and it's probably not a metal. It's probably two non-metals. Let's do it like this. Only now, this one has a stronger attraction for electrons than the other one does. And we use a symbol like that, an arrow with a positive on one end. This means, this says this, this is the positive, slight positive end, this is the slight negative end. And you get a separation of charge in the bond itself. So what that means is the electrons tend to spend more time on this side than they do on that side. And that gives you a, a slight negative charge on this side of the bond, and slight positive charge on that side. And we can, um, have I introduced electronegativity yet? I've been using the term. I haven't talked about it yet, have I? Okay. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. Maybe I better look at my hard copy and see where I'm headed first. Oh, it's coming up. Sorry. No, this is electronegativity. It's a different type concept. Okay. Well, I'm going to talk about that in just a minute. More than I have before. <laughs> <laughs> so this, this results in a separation of charge. You know, it's slightly negative on one side, slightly positive on the other. And when you get that uh, polarity in the bond, which can be measured, right? In this case, we're measuring the pol polarity of the bond between hydrogen and fluorine. And uh, fluorine is going to be the slight negative side, and hydrogen is going to be the slight positive side. And we can measure the polarity of that bond. 
All we have to do is put that gas between two plates, positively and negatively charged plates, and we can adjust the strength of the magnetic field uh, over, over uh, a series of increments and find out exactly where all of those molecules are aligned. Right. It's, it's an art. Okay, so we mentioned this before. The definition for a chemical bond. Why do atoms bond with each other? Of course, it's because, um, according to one definition, it's because that the energy of the molecule is lower than the energy of the individual atoms, the separate atoms. How do they bond? Well, they can either transfer electrons or they can share electrons or they can have somewhere in between. Now, electronegativity, my apologies. <clears throat> what we mean by electronegativity, first of all, the concept was developed in the, in the beginning of the 19th century. And it, it was studied by several different uh, chemists, scientists in those days. Uh, it was first proposed by Berzelius. Uh, Berzelius, he's the same one that uh, proposed the symbol scheme for our elements, right? He's the one that won out. And it's a good thing he did because there were some other weird ones out there. Dalton had some that were just off the wall. <clears throat> anyway, um, so this concept was an attempt to um, describe the character of a bond. So electronegativity really has has no meaning except in the bond itself. Now we can assign values to individual elements for the purpose of forming imaginary bonds and comparing the two electronegativities to say something about the potential for a bond forming between the two and what does it look like. But the actual measurements take place when a bond has formed. And we then the calculations are done on the the simple bond itself. And it's an expression of the ability of an atom in a molecule to attract shared electrons to itself. So uh, Linus Pauling, uh, several scientists came up with various schemes for calculating relative values of electronegativity, and Linus Pauling's is one of the most widely accepted ones. And we're not going to actually calculate them ourselves. We're just going to use the values. Right. This is just a side note. Uh, Pauling won the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 1954 for his research on the nature of the chemical bond. In fact, he wrote a book entitled The Nature of the Chemical Bond. And at that time, uh, in the late 40s and early 50s, um, he was he drew together, he pulled together everything that we knew about the chemical bond and try to, to in a book, uh, make a, a coherent story about what the chemical bond was. And uh, it was so agreeable to, to most people and especially the Nobel Prize Committee uh, that they, they gave him a prize in 54 for it. Usually Nobel Prizes aren't, aren't given to you until maybe 10 years or more after you've done the basic research or, or made the accomplishments because they want to see if there's, if they've got legs that can last. Right. And if they do, then you might get a prize for it. Uh, he also, he's one of the few uh, recipients of the Nobel prize who actually won two of them in, and actually two different uh, categories. He got the Nobel Peace Prize in 62. He was against nuclear uh, proliferation. All right. So in effect, what Pauling's system says is that there's an expected uh, bond energy that can be calculated. And what you do is you measure the bond energy between, um, say, in this case, you have... Um, Say two hydrogens, and there's a bond energy here that can be measured, the energy of the H2, 
And then there's another element that you combine with it, only you determine the, the bond energy of this X2. And then you say the expected bond energy between H and X, the energy of H and X is calculated. This is expected value. You take the energy of, of this one and you add the energy of this one, uh, H2, and then you divide by two. And that's the expected energy for this one, where you have this one by itself, this one with its identical, and this one with its identical, and then this one with each other. And that's the, uh, the expected energy. Then you measure the actual energy of this bond, and you compare the two. And that's where we get the, uh, uh, the difference between the two actual, the delta, the difference between those two, the actual minus the expected. Um, if, if their electronegativities are equal, these two, then the difference between them will be zero. Okay. And none of them are like that. There are, there's no zero on the, on the, in his table. None at all. They're all positive values. Some are small fractions and some of them are, uh, like fluorine is, uh, uh, a number four. That's the highest you can get. So that's just a, a rough outline of how Pauling calculated the, uh, uh, electronegativities. Okay, so on the periodic table, the electronegativities generally increase across the period from left to right. Okay. So if we're in this period, then lithium is going to be the lowest electronegativity in that group in that period, and fluorine is going to be the highest. We don't use these, right, <laughs> because um, uh, they don't form bonds, typically. So we just don't even, we don't even consider the noble gases at all. At least not in Pauling scale. Um, and the electronegativities uh, increase from bottom to top. Okay, so increase this way, increase this way. So for the whole periodic table, electronegativities increase from lower left to upper right. You know, same as ionization energies, same trend. And we start with uh, cesium or francium. Francium is radioactive, so we don't mess with it too much. But cesium, we start with that one at 0.7, and then uh, we can go up, we can go to the right, or we can go across the chart like this, and we get to the highest one at fluorine is four. And that's a, a representation of a periodic table where the, the height of the... Uh, of the uh, column underneath the element is indicative of its electronegativity. And you'll notice that as, as long as you stay in the representative elements, right, the first two columns and the last six columns, then the trend is fairly consistent from left to right. Uh, bottom to top and left to right uh, is fairly consistent. It's when you get into the transition elements that they sort of, they sort of roller coaster, they hump. So the highest electronegativity, it peaks out, uh, it looks like uh, at gold. Yeah, gold has the, has the highest one I can see there. But then it goes back down for zinc, cadmium, and mercury before you get into the representative elements again. So it's just that the transition elements um, want to be difficult. All right, so let's take this information and see if we can draw some conclusions. Actually, if we can say something about the relative electronegativities of these elements. Lithium and fluorine react, which has more attraction for an electron? Well, they're in the same period, so the fluorine would have a greater attraction for electrons than lithium because it's further to the right. 
and then a bond between fluorine and iodine. Right? And believe it or not, you can get bonds between uh, halogens, iodine and fluorine. So fluorine would still have the greatest attraction for electrons. Okay. Uh, right, lower left to upper right is the trend. Now, an explanation for the trend, if you go from left to right across the period, you're in the same energy level. Remember, this is uh, N equals 2. Right? The principal quantum number is 2 here. So as you go from left to right, you're adding protons, but you're not moving the electrons significantly further away from the nucleus. So they're all feeling uh, a greater and greater and greater uh, effective nuclear charge as you go from left to right. So that increases the strength of attraction for electrons. If you go from, if you go from uh, top to bottom, then the electronegativity decreases because you are adding energy levels and you're adding electrons on top of the protons that are being added. And what happens is these inner core electrons are shielding the nucleus from the outer electrons. So they don't feel, feel the pull as great as greatly uh, for the outer the valence electrons as uh, the ones above them. So you're decreasing electronegativity for that atom as you go down. Now, here's a, a general, uh, if you take the electronegativities and subtract them, subtract one from the other, the lower from the higher, and get a number, then we can say something about the character of the bond that would form between those two atoms, those two elements. And if the, if the difference in electronegativities is between zero and 0.2, we say that that's a nonpolar covalent. In other words, the difference in their electronegativities is not enough to make the bond polar. If the difference is between, let's see, we would go to 0.3 next, I see. Yeah, 0.3 to 1.4, then this would be a polar covalent bond. And that's only if both of the atoms are nonmetals. They have to form the covalent bond before you can say this about the polarity. If it if the um, difference in electronegativity is greater than or equal to 1.5, then this is definitely ionic. And you're only going to see this between a metal and a non-metal. But sometimes if you put a, not a metal and a non-metal together, then you'll get their electronegativities in here somewhere. And if that's the case, this, is, this would be um, non-metal, non-metal. If you happen to have a metal, non-metal, then we would still call that an ionic bond. Okay. So it's, this is kind of gray area, middle ground. All right, so let's see if we can put these in order. Um, I'm gonna leave that up there for now. Most polar to least polar. So let's see, what do we have? Um, we have uh, N, F, we have O, F, and C, F. O, F, and C, F. Those bonds. Okay. If we want to put them in order from most polar to least polar, then the most polar is going to be the one where the two elements are the first furthest separation from each other in the periodic table. Carbon and fluorine are, they've got two in between them. Oxygen and fluorine are right next door, and nitrogen and fluorine is only one between them. So I would say carbon and fluorine would be the most polar, and then nitrogen and fluorine followed by oxygen and fluorine. Okay, I'm pretty sure that's the order. 
Come on. There we go. Carbon nitrogen oxygen. Okay. B, the next one, is not going to be so easy because it's a mixture. This one was elements with fluorine, every one of them. So that was fairly easy to do. If we have carbon and fluorine to choose from and nitrogen and oxygen and silicon and fluorine, right? so which one's furthest apart? Well, silicon and fluorine are the furthest apart on the periodic table because we're between, we're skipping down one uh, period to go to silicon. We go to carbon and then down one, so it's it's much greater. And I would think that then carbon and fluorine would be a little less and then nitrogen and fluorine. See if I got that one right. Nitrogen and oxygen. Oh, no, excuse me. Let's see. Is that the same reasoning? Nitrogen and oxygen. Oh, yeah, they're right next door to each other. Okay, there we go. <laughs> All right, so that was that. Now, how about C? What do we have to go on here? Chlorine and chlorine. And then we have uh, boron and chlorine. And sulfur and chlorine. Okay. This is definitely going to be the minimum. I mean, it's not even going to, there's, it's going to have a, a delta of zero. A uh, difference in electronegativity of zero. So chlorine and chlorine ought to be here. And then we have to say boron and sulfur. How about those? Boron to chlorine versus sulfur to chlorine. Sulfur to chlorine is, they're very close to one another. So I would put those there and then boron to chlorine would be here. Would be the greatest. Okay. Now that's just a, um, uh, a qualitative or semi-quantitative approach. You can actually put them in order if you if you look at a periodic table with their electronegativities, subtract them, then it's simple. Put them in order. Okay, which of the following bonds would be the least polar yet still be considered polar covalent? All right, so now we're actually going to we're going to do some calculations. Oops, I shouldn't have done that. This was 0 to 0 0.2, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. 0 0.3 to 1.4. Okay. And we're going to need those. <laughs> Magne now, we want to be covalent. Right? If we have magnesium and oxygen, that's a metal and a non-metal. It's not covalent at all. So magnesium and oxygen, right? We don't even consider that one. That's not covalent. Carbon and oxygen, yeah. So carbon and oxygen, we would look at oxygen is 3.5 and carbon is 2.5. 3.5 minus 2.5 equals one. So that would be polar covalent. Right. Then uh, oxygen, oxygen, uh, right? They're they're non-metals, but they're not polar at all. So we can't say they're least polar covalent because they're not even polar. How about silicon and oxygen? Right, silicon's right on the border. Right, and it's uh, let's see, silicon is one point eight, and oxygen is is still three point five. So 3.5 minus 1.8 is equal to 1.7, okay? That would be ionic, All right? So that's not polar covalent either. And I didn't realize that because silicon is actually a, uh, it's a not it's a non-metal, but it's a metalloid because it's right on the line. This, this line between the two goes right there. Metalloid, 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 metalloid. So that would be considered uh, 1.7. That would be considered an ionic bond. So it's not covalent. And nitrogen, oxygen. 
Uh, oxygen is 3.5, nitrogen is 3. 3 minus, uh, let's say 3. Yeah, 3.5 minus 3 is 0 0.5. So this one is also polar covalent. So the most, the least polar covalent would be nitrogen and oxygen. And still be polar. All right. Now, the most polar without being considered ionic. Well, the most polar then would be this carbon and oxygen. All right, so when we represent these bonds with our um, arrow, <clears throat> what we are expressing is what's called the dipole moment. Moment comes from physics. Moment means a force in this direction. So a dipole moment means that the force, the, in our case, the negativity, is in that direction. And we represent the dipole moment with an arrow showing the negative end, and that identifies the positive end on the tail. All right, and there it is. It points toward the negative end. Now, the next, we've talked about the the uh, polarity of bonds. But where we're headed is to, to gain an understanding of how molecules behave with one another. And in order to do that, we have to know, is the molecule, the whole molecule, does it exhibit polar behavior or nonpolar behavior? And in order to that, do that, we need two bits of information. One is, are the bonds polar? So if we want to know the polarity of the molecule, we have to first know that the bonds are polar, bond polarity. Right. And we've done that so far. The second is, we have to know the geometry of the molecule. The reason being, if you have something like, um, oh, let's see. Let's say you have um, an X in the middle and a Y on this end and the same atom on this end. And the Ys are both more electronegative than the X. And they're giving us that situation. Okay. And this molecule is linear. So these are equal in magnitude, but opposite in direction. They cancel each other out. So that means the bonds are polar, but the molecule is not. Because the polarities cancel, and the whole molecule now is nonpolar. So we need to know those two bits of information. So I guess you've guessed by now, we're headed toward molecular geometry eventually. Now, an example, of course, water is a good example. Right? We're going to prove this later. Why water is like this. Water is actually a bent molecule. And oxygen is more electronegative than hydrogen. Right? We can look at it up there. Right? Three and a half, and I think hydrogen is 2.1. So we get a moment this direction, a moment this direction, and has anybody been introduced to vector analysis? No. Okay, it's a thing with physics and some math courses. If you have a um, if you have a point of attachment of uh, two forces, and that force is pulling this direction at that point, and there's another force pulling this direction with that force. Right, and this is relative strength, so that one's a greater force than this one is. 
then the um, the vector sum of these two is this amount of those two. Okay, it has the same effect as if you had one force pulling on that point with this amount of force. Okay, so um, if we look at it in those terms, uh, this um, vector or this dipole moment is moving that direction and this one moving that direction. If we add them together, that means the whole molecule has a dipole in that direction. Okay, and that means that the, uh, the water molecule is definitely polar. And that's a good thing. That polarity means that these water molecules attract one another. Right? And it takes more energy to get them apart. So that means, and we'll talk about this in more detail in, in the second semester. Um, that means that their boiling point is very high. And so we can have liquid water on the surface of the earth instead of gaseous water. As it takes more energy to get them apart. Right? At these temperatures and pressures, if it wasn't for that fact, if water was nonpolar, then there wouldn't be any liquid water on Earth at, at all. Probably wouldn't be any water left because if it's a gas, it's going to eventually fall into space. <coughs> okay. And the other example, and this, this is drawn badly, but we know that carbon dioxide is that way with a double bond between the carbon and the oxygen. They are only showing the single bond, but I guess we can forgive them for, for now because that's not the point. <laughs> the point is that the dipole moment is equal from carbon to oxygen on both sides, but the molecule is linear, so they cancel one another out. The vector addition of these two pointing in opposite directions is zero. There's no dipole moment for this molecule. Now, that doesn't mean that they don't take advantage of uneven distribution of electric, electric charge. Because look at that right one. It, what it's showing is the red end is higher electron density. In other words, it's, it's polar for those bonds. And you still have that there. The, bond, the molecule overall is nonpolar. But you still have that slight redistribution of electrical charge. And this nonpolar molecule is going to behave differently than some other nonpolar molecule. This one will behave differently than, say, uh, example. Carbon dioxide is nonpolar. And nitrogen gas, those are free electrons. Nitrogen gas is nonpolar too. This is nonpolar because the vector addition is zero. But this is nonpolar because the bonds are not polar to begin with. And they don't behave the same. We can say that they're nonpolar, both of them, but they don't have the same behavior. And here's proof. Um, dry ice will sublimate if the temperature rises above negative 78.5 degrees C. It'll go straight from solid to gas. But nitrogen liquefies at minus 195 degrees C. Right? If they were exactly the same polarity, if they were both nonpolar but the same nonpolar, then they'd have exactly the same values. Right? But they don't. Right? So just because we say it's nonpolar doesn't mean it's identical to its nonpolar neighbor. A different molecule. But it's a beginning, right? We're going to say something is nonpolar or polar uh, gives us a, a place to start with discussing how molecules behave. Okay. Um, regular shapes. Okay. If we have, let me see, let me make some room over here. 
if we have, say, um, two atoms bound together, there's only one possible shape for that is linear. Um, if we have another one on this side and it's in that arrangement, it's linear. Right? Carbon dioxide is an example. If we have actually a central atom and then three, their ideal shape would be a triangle, right? And you draw an imaginary line here, here, and here. That outlines a triangle. But these are not the bonds. The bonds are still here. But this shape is triangular. And we call it trigonal planar. Trigonal being the triangle, and planar means everything's in the same plane. Okay? The next one would be where you have A in the middle, and you have four Bs around it. So we can say in, in behind there, we've got a B. And then out here, we've got another B, another B, and then up here, we've got a B. So we have this triangular base here, and then we draw a connection there, there, and then this one there. And the, the regular shape, the, the most ideal position for all of these Bs is a tetrahedron, right? A triangular base pyramid is a tetrahedron. All right? Does anybody have geometry? Y'all didn't get geometry? You didn't get geometry. Okay, so you know about regular shapes. Good. She's got a step ahead of it. <laughs> We're only going to use a few of them. Right? We've talked about the linear, talked about the triangular, the trigonal planar, talked about the tetrahedral, and uh, there are a couple more that I'll, I'll introduce as we need them. Right? There are other shapes. <clears throat> that was just an introduction to sort of um, get you thinking in those veins. What we're trying to do is produce the shape with the lowest energy. And if you have atoms surrounding a central atom, what you want to do is get the electrons in the bonds as far apart from each other as possible. So that there's the minimum repulsion. And that's what those regular shapes do. And you said you want the shape with the lowest energy. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah, it's, you want to get those bonds as far apart from each other as possible. And if there are any uh, free unbonded pairs, you want to get those uh, far away from them as well. And we'll show you how to do that. Uh, <clears throat> now, we've already covered this. Right, for elements in the, in the second and third period, their ideal number of electrons in their valence shell is eight. Right? That's the octet rule. Now, we can get exceptions to the octet rule. Right? You can have more electrons than eight, but those occur uh, with... Uh, elements that have access to d orbitals right, in the third, right? Uh, well, once we get down below the third here, when we get in here, now we're in three Ds. So everybody in this range has access to d orbitals, and you can get more electrons um, surrounding a central atom uh, in the fourth period and, and above. Now, if we go back to, uh, let's, we're taking 10 as an example. Um, 10 would be, let's see, its electronic configuration has 50, right? So we're going to start with krypton as the core, right, 36. And then krypton, we're going to go over here to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, S, 5, S, 2, then 4D, 10, then 5P, 1, 2. Now, that should be 50. 36, 46, and 4 is 50. There we go. So, remember, the valence electrons are the highest principal quantum number. So, you can have 2 here and 2 here. And that's why 10, when it forms an ion, it can either lose these two higher ones and make uh, a 10 two plus, it loses two of these electrons, 
or it can lose those two electrons and those two, and it makes that one. So the most common ions for 10 are two and four based upon losing these two or losing all four of them. Okay. And we can follow that reasoning for lead also, right? Lead is in the same family. So instead of 5s2 and 5p2, it has 6s2 and 6p2. And it can form a 2 plus or a 4 plus ion. And then you can go to uh, bismuth. Bismuth is here. So it's going to have, uh, let's see. It's going to have a 6s2, 5d10, and a 6p3. And then its core, bismuth is here, so its core is going to be xenon. And this is bismuth. <clears throat> so for this one, you can either lose these three and produce a bismuth 3+, plus, or you can lose these three and those two and make a bismuth five plus. Now, when you do that, of course, when you lose electrons, what happens to the, the ion compared to its neutral atom? It shrinks, right? Because the electrons are out here. They're gone now, right? It shrinks down to the uh, 5D level. And um, thallium is similar, right? Except thallium only has um, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, yeah. It has 6S2 and 6P1. So it can lose 1P and make a, a thallium one plus, or I can lose three more and make a thallium four plus. No, three plus. It loses two, three plus. There we go. All right, that's enough of that. So when two nonmetals react to form a covalent bond, they share electrons in a way that completes their valence electron configurations, and that's why we reference the octet. When a nonmetal and a representative a representative group metal react to form a binary ionic compound. The ions form so that the valence electron configuration of the nonmetal achieves the electron configuration of the next noble gas. In other words, if uh, when we do this, the next noble gas would be to um, lose five electrons. Let's see. Yeah, lose five electrons. And that would make, actually, uh, yeah, which you'd still have, xenon is going to have, um, that doesn't work too well <laughs> when you have lots of D electrons. It works better when you're, when you're uh, no greater than calcium. Then you can lose two electrons and look like argon. Or if you're magnesium, you can use, lose two electrons that look like neon. All right, that rule doesn't work so well when you have D electrons. Right, so uh, there are limits to that um, rule. An isoelectronic series. We talked. Did we talk about isoelectronic series when we were doing electronic configurations? I thought we did. Simply, an isoelectronic series is simply. A, a group of uh, elements, and many of them will be ionized, so that their electronic configurations are identical. Now, in the case of, of uh, oxygen 2 minus, fluorine 1 minus, sodium plus 1, magnesium 2 plus, and aluminum 3 plus, those all have the same electronic configuration as neon. Fluorine gets there by adding one electron. Oxygen gets there by adding two electrons. Right? One, two. And sodium, magnesium, and aluminum get there by losing electrons. So sodium would lose one electron and look like neon. Magnesium would lose two and look like neon. 
aluminum would lose one, two, three. It looked like neon. So all of their electronic configurations are identical and they look like neon. That's an isoelectronic series. Now you can have an isoelectronic series without approaching a noble gas configuration, but that's the easiest one to understand. All right, for this one, an alkaline metal, alkaline earth, noble gas, and halogen, so if they have the same, all right, so we could do um, argon, right? We could use chlorine as the halogen, add one electron, make it a chlorine minus one. Or we could say potassium with a plus one and calcium with a plus two and and then, of course, they would all look like argon. That would be an, an isoelectronic series. Okay? They would all have the same electronic configuration. Now, they have different protons, of course, because they're different elements. But their number of electrons and, and the energy levels that the electrons occupy are the same. Right. And there's the electronic configuration for argon. The number of electrons will be the same. The number of protons will be different. Okay. Um, maybe we had done this. Periodic trends, periodic trends. Oh, we had those. Yeah, we had periodic table. We did trends. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, so we're dredging up some old stuff here to kind of round out the discussion. So we know the um, atomic size, atomic size gets smaller from left to right, and it gets smaller from bottom to top, okay? We know ionization energy gets bigger from lower left to upper right, right? We know that, um, uh, okay, it's introduced a new one here. Electronegativity, we did a little while ago, lower left to upper right increases. Um, one that is left out is electron affinity, right? The more negative the number, the stronger its affinity for electrons. So that's also lower left to upper right is more negative. Right? The stronger electron, affi uh, electron affinity. That's not in this group, though. Um, but the ion radius is another tricky one because it depends on the ion that's formed and the neutral atom from which it's formed. All right, so we're not going to spend a lot of time on that one because it, it really is trouble. Sometimes you can predict and sometimes you can't. Okay, if we have a solid binary ionic compound, what are the factors that influence the stability of the structure? Well, one of the primary uh, stabilizing factors is the amount of the lattice energy. We have to define what lattice energy is. And I think I can erase this now. So we're going now from covalent and we're switching to ionic. All right, so for binary ionic compounds, the lattice energy, excuse me, is you take the uh, cation with its charge, and it doesn't have to be one, but I'm using this as, a, as an example, a singly charged cation and a singly charged anion, and they must be gaseous. They have to be gas. When they come together, they will form this compound as a solid. So we're going from free gas ions down to a solid 
ionic compound. And when that happens, you get a release of a huge amount of energy with a negative value, right? It's extremely exothermic. That's the definition of lattice energy. Okay. Now, if we if we look at it in terms of the uh, Coulomb's uh, equation, lattice energy would be uh, that energy uh, lattice. It's identified as such. Is equal to some proportionality constant, and this may be different than that value that we saw earlier. It depends on the units of measure. Then you have the charge on, on one of them, the charge on the second one. In this case, they're going to be opposite charges. And then the distance between them. The lattice energy will, will inform us about this arrangement over here. Right? This is calculated. All right? This is measured, actually. You measure the lattice energy. And this is the calculated, <laughs> what we would expect the lattice energy to be. So if we already know what this is, and we can measure the distance between them, and we know the charge, then we can calculate the K. All right. So when we actually take a metal, and in this case, we're going to say, um, let's get rid of this stuff now. When we're actually forming an ionic compound, right, we usually start with, um, a metal, and it's a solid, right? And then we have a non-metal, uh, what we call X, and it could be uh, we have solid non-metals, we have liquid non-metals, we have gaseous non-metals. So it could be any one of those. Okay. But the metals, except for mercury, are going to be solid. So we're going to divide this into steps, right? These are the things that we think happen in order to get to the ionic compound. So we're going to start with the metal first. What happens to the metal? Well, if the metal happens to be solid, then we've got to get it into the gaseous state. Or if it's liquid, we'll go into the gaseous state. We just, we're just freeing the metal atoms from one another. We've got to put energy in. So this is endothermic. So the delta H here is going to be positive. We have to put, we have to, it costs us energy. Then we have to ionize the metal. So we got the ionize, we got the gas, we're going to put energy in, right? And you saw this one earlier, actually. And this has an electron there. And this costs us energy. Okay? Now, if we form a if multiple positive charge, we got to go through another step, right? We got to take this one and strip off another electron. That adds more energy, right? Before our example here is just a single charged metal, but it could be more than one charge, right? Then we have to, uh, that's what we do for the metal. Then for the non-metal, the non-metal, we have to take the, uh, Uh, our example here is diatomic. Okay. That's not always the case. But hopefully the example... <coughs> Let me see. These are numbered. The example says that we have a diatomic element in the gaseous phase, and we're going to split it into... Um, Actually, we only want half. So this has this costs us energy also. We would have to modify these steps depending on what the actual elements are. Okay. Then we take that separate gaseous molecule and we 
Ionizing. Uh, no, excuse me. This is a non-metal. This is electron affinity. There we go. And when that happens, we get energy back. Yeah. We get energy back from this one. So this is negative, right? Exothermic. And then step five is we take this metal in its gaseous state, and we add this non-metal in its gaseous state and yields the ionic compound. This is the lattice energy. And this is uh, huge, 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 huge exothermic. All right, those are the steps that we imagine that um, a metal and a non-metal go through to form an ionic solid. And this is what the energy thing would look like. Um, the one on the left is one series, one formation of magnesium uh, oxide. One on the right is the formation of sodium fluoride. All right, so don't get them confused. <clears throat> the overall energy change is in green for each one at the bottom here. So you see that the lattice energy depends on all right, what they are. Magnesium and oxygen has a huge lattice energy, whereas uh, sodium and fluorine have uh, a lesser lattice energy. And I think that has to do with their difference in electronegativities, right? Sodium and fluorine, sodium's over there, fluorine's over here. Magnesium is over there, and fluorine's over here. But uh, I misspoke. It's not just the electronegativity, but the difference in charge. All right, <clears throat> so this is what that scenario would look like for a lithium fluoride formation. That overall equation, the lithium solid plus half of fluorine makes lithium fluoride. And that would be the formation energy. When we talked about that, uh, well, maybe we haven't talked about that. The, the, the way you write the formation energy for a compound is you start with the compound first. Okay. And then you work backwards. In its standard state, fluorine is F2 as a gas. This is a solid. And lithium is a solid like that. So you only need half of these. All right. So this is always one mole, and then we have to adjust this one to make that one. And then there's a value that's associated with it. Okay, so when you do that, you've got to go through these steps. You got to sublime um, the solid to the gas. Right? This is sublimation. How much energy does it take to do that? And then you've got to <coughs> take the separate lithium gas atoms and ionize them. Right, this is ionization energy. And then you've got to take, uh, next slide, you've got to dissociate the fluorines, right? So this would be, I don't know if this has a separate name. No, it doesn't. You just break the bonds between the fluorine atoms. Then you take the individual fluorines, and this is electron affinity. And then this is lattice energy. And when you put all those together, right, and there are the values for each one, when you add all those together, you get the overall change of minus 617 kilojoules per mole to form lithium fluoride. And there's the, the process in a table form. All right. I mentioned earlier that uh, the 
the dis the continuum between ionic and covalent bond, uh, they have either uh, they have partial ionic character and partial covalent character. So the percent ionic character is simply you measure the dipole moment of X Y uh, for that bond, and then you calculate the expected uh, dipole moment based upon their their uh, the ions that are the two ions that are coming together, and you ratio them. And that gives you a percent ionic character. And this is a distribution of, of diatomics, uh, di uh, diatomic ionic compounds or covalent compounds as the case may be. And this, the x-axis is the, the delta electronegativity, the difference in electronegativities. So if you have very small electronegativities, the percent ionic character, of course, is gonna be very small. And if you have electronegativity differences that are very high, you're going to get more percent ionic character. That's all that's saying. All right. There's also an operational definition of ionic compounds. <clears throat> I remember when I was working on my PhD, uh, I had uh, one of my advisors was uh, uh, they specialized in soil chemistry. And I said, okay, I want to find out what types of manganese are in this soil sample. And he says, okay, you do this extraction and then you follow it with this extraction and you get different fractions of manganese out of it. I said, okay, now how do I name these fractions? He says, you don't. You just say how it's done. Right? Each step is operationally defined. It's however you want it to be. <laughs> so that's where we're headed with this. Is any compound that conducts an electric current when melted or dissolved in a uh, where the ions are separated. If it conducts electricity, then it's an ionic compound. So if you have sodium chloride, sodium chloride in a big solid crystal, right? I've seen pictures of them, right? It's going to be a cube. And what you're going to have is sodiums and chlorines and sodiums and chlorines and then you're going to have chlorines here and you're going to have chlorine here and then you're going to have uh, sodium here and it's just going to be a network of positive and negative charges right but they're in a solid that means they're locked in place and if you put an electrode on this side with a negative charge an electrode on this side with a positive charge and you connect them through your battery Let's see, it's this way. And then through a light bulb, right? Then no light will not conduct electricity. And the reason is there are no mobile ions that can carry the charge from one electrode to the other. That's the nature of solid ionic compounds. But if you melt it, right, if you make it into a liquid or you put it in an aqueous solution, then it will readily conduct electricity. And that means uh, by our operational definition, it's an ionic compound. Um, if you take sugar, right, sucrose, solid, Right? It won't conduct electricity, but you dissolve it in water, it still won't conduct electricity because <laughs> it's not an ion. So that's not an ion compound. All right. <clears throat> so if we go back to um, our discussion of laws and theories, remember what a law is. It just says what? What happens? It doesn't try to explain why it happens or even how it happens. 
Right? If you get to a theory, then the theory makes an attempt to explain why or how. Usually both, how and why. And when we try to explain uh, how and why a law works, we're also usually going to create a model. That model is a representation of the real world. It's not the real world. It represents the real world. And we incorporate factors into that model that we think are major influences on how it behaves. And once we have the model, then we can change some of those factors and see how it affects the behavior of the law or the theory overall. That's what makes theories more powerful than laws. Because the laws, you can't change them. If you change one little thing, the law falls apart. It only works under specific conditions because we don't know why. Okay, so that's the first law, uh, first factor, uh, first um, postulate in forming a model. A model does not equal reality. Models are oversimplifications. And for that reason, uh, very many of them are wrong. Uh, some of them are physical representations, like, like model airplanes, model battleships. Um, some of them are mathematical, right? a mathematical model of your system. Um, some of them are more ethereal than that. They're more artistic, but they all try to represent the reality. Right? Um, there's one good example where the models, every one of them has failed. Every one, without exception. And that's the climate models. All climate, there are a couple of dozen of them and every one of them fails. But scientists, they're, they're kind of like children. The scientists that create them, they won't hang on to them. <laughs> so they, they add factors, they try to tweak them to make them agree with reality. But as soon as they do, the climate changes and it changes in a way that the model can't predict. And so there you have it. Um, models tend to become more complicated with time and they're modified with age. So in order to make a model useful, we have to understand what are the underlying assumptions that are, that are go into creating the model. And we have to, Keep those assumptions in mind always so that we don't abuse the model. We don't misuse it. Try to make it do something that it can't. When a model is wrong, uh, very often, I mean, if we're true to science, when the model is wrong, we learn something from it. That's where climate scientists, well, not all of them, but a great many of them, um, have failed as scientists. When their model fails, they don't try to understand why it fails. They just try to make it uh, agree with their preconceived notions. Right? And that's why they fail. <laughs> so remember what we do with the, with the theory. If the theory fails and the model with it, right, we have three choices, remember? We can modify it. Talked about that one. Right? We can restrict it. Restrict its use. So if these assumptions, if we, if we enter a territory where the assumptions are no longer valid, then we can't use it anymore. So we say we're, we're going to restrict its use. Uh, classical mechanics, Newtonian physics, works within a, a, a range of masses. If you get too big, like the center of a galaxy, the black holes, uh, neutron stars and things, the that model falls apart. So then we go to relativity, use a different model. We get too small, then it falls apart again. And then when we get down that uh, to the small range, we have to go to quantum mechanics. So that's a, an example where we restrict its use. And then the, the last resort is um, trashing. Just throw it out and start over again. Those are our three possibilities. If the theory fails and the model fails with it, then we have those choices.
All right. There you go. <laughs> I forgot I had a slide on that. <laughs> uh, yes, <laughs> some models get pretty ridiculous. All right. Uh, physicists have proposed uh, 26 dimensions to accommodate the theory, various theories of the universe. All right. I think that's ridiculous too. But these are all mathematical models. Right. They only work in the in the region of uh, numbers. Right. We what we see in reality is length, width, depth, and time. That's it. That's as far as I can go. All right. Oh yeah, I forgot that good example. J.J. Thompson's plum pudding plum pudding model of the atom, right where you had the the electrons scattered throughout the the pudding, and everything else was just a, a diffuse positive charge. Right then, when Rutherford came along and and proved his nuclear model of the atom, the plum pudding model was dead. I mean, it it didn't even linger, right? Everybody rejected it from that point on. Okay. So how are we doing on, on time? It's two o'clock. We're into lab time already. Let's see. It'd be nice if I could finish the discussion. Yeah. Then we would have, let's see. Well, we got a buffer Thursday. And so we, we could finish the discussion on Thursday uh, and then do a review on the following Tuesday. But that Tuesday, we're going to have a lab. So I, I'd like not to. Uh, actually, I'd rather split the review between the two days and finish the, the introduction on one day. I think that then would give us more time to discuss problems out of the review document. Let's do it. That's the way we did it last time, wasn't it? The last, yeah, let's do it that way. So I'll finish this discussion today. All right. So <clears throat> when two atoms have formed a bond, uh, they are theoretically at a lower energy state. So in order to break the bond, we have to add energy to it. Right, so breaking the bond is an endothermic process. We have to add energy to the system. Forming bonds is an exothermic process. It releases energy with the accompanying signs. Now, I said that to go at the different types of bonds, the single, double, and triple bonds. When we represent um, bonding between two elements, if it's a single bond, we have a single pair of electrons between them. Right? And we represent that with a single line. If it's a double bond, then we have two pair of electrons and we represent that with a double line. And of course, with the triple bond, we have three pairs between them and then we represent that with three lines. So anytime you see a line between two atoms, two symbols, that line represents two electrons. What we also know is that as we, if these are the same elements, well, actually, they don't have to be the same elements. In general, the bond length, this direction, shortens. And that represent that also is correlated with the bond strength. So the, the double bond is stronger than the single, and the triple bond is stronger than the double. And the bond length decreases. Now, the decrease is not linear. In other words, if you go from a single to a double, the, the bond length does not shrink. Say this one is, uh, I don't know, um, 0.8 nanometers then the double is not going to be 0.4. All right, we're going, to, we're going to discuss that eventually, why that's not the case. Um, 
and the bond energies increase as you go down, uh, shortens the bond length, increases uh, bond energy. And the bond energy is not a linear increase either. A right, single bond takes a certain amount of energy to break. The double bond takes a little more, but not twice as much. And then triple bond, not tripled the amount. Right, so it increases, but not linearly. Come on. There we go. Skip one. There we go. Now, the, the value, the required energies for breaking these bonds are all going to be positive right? because we have to add energy. So that means all of these values in that table, and this, came, this comes straight out of your textbook, those values are all going to be positive because they're energy required to go in and break that bond. You have to add that much energy to break these bonds. So a hydrogen-hydrogen bond takes 432, uh, I think that's kilojoules per mole. HF takes more. HCl uh, takes less than the, the hydrogen bond. Right, so you have those various uh, bond energies. And then you'll notice that if we go uh, a single, right over here on the left, a single carbon-carbon bond is 347. A double carbon bond is 614. So it's not quite double the amount. And a triple bond is 839. So it's not quite triple. All right, now why are we showing you those values? Come on. Uh, all right. I think that was a duplicated slide. What we can do with those bond energies, once they've been calculated, then we can calculate the enthalpy of a given reaction based upon the bonds that are broken and the bonds that are formed. Okay. So the bonds that are broken are in the first term. We can calculate the delta H of any reaction by adding up, that's that the capital sigma, adding up the number of bonds broken. I don't know why they put D there. Uh, broken bonds. Right, energy going in, so that's positive. And subtract the values of energy for the bonds formed. <clears throat> right? So these values, this is going to be positive, this is going to be positive, and this Negative means that we're going to get energy. Uh, let's see, we put energy in, we get energy back with these. So if we subtract the energy we get back from the energy we put in, we can tell whether the enthalpy for the reaction is going to be positive or negative, and actually how much it is. Okay, so let's do an example. Here we have a very, very simple reaction. CH3, and this is in triple bond carbon. This is a gas. And the only difference is CH3. We flip this around like that. So what that means, this is um, uh, accepted notation for organic compounds. When you put the hydrogens to the right of the carbon, that means these hydrogens are actually attached to the carbon. And that carbon is attached to the next nitrogen like that. Okay. It doesn't mean that the hydrogens are attached to the nitrogen. It goes like this. Like that. So on this side, you would have the hydrogens there, and then you would have this carbon, and then you would have like that. So the only difference here between the two, right, these bonds are all the same. This is a different bond, and that's the same bond, nitrogen to carbon. So the only difference is between this carbon-nitrogen and the carbon-carbon. 
right? So you can go in and you can do all of them, right? You can do three moles of carbon hydrogen bonds and then add one mole of carbon nitrogen bonds and one mole of nitrogen triple bond carbon over here. And then you can do the same thing on this side and subtract them. But the simpler way to do it is to say, this is the same on both sides. And this is the same on both sides, or actually, so all you have is this one versus this one, one mole of each. And carbon nitrogen is 305, one mole, and subtract carbon carbon, 347. And that's going to give you a negative value. Let's see, two, negative 42 kilojoules per mole. Okay. Now, they're on, not all going to be that easy, right? <laughs> because uh, if you have all different bonds before and after, then you got to go through the whole process. That's where I normally would pause. Come on. There we go. All right. The reason I paused there was because we're going to get into a completely different field. We talked about theories. Now, this is a, uh, this theory of bond formation called the valence bond theory simply says that the electrons surrounding the atoms, only the valence electrons are involved in the bonding. Right? The core electrons have nothing to do with the bond formation. And the bond is actually formed from the overlap of two atomic orbitals. So the atomic orbitals still belong to each of the atoms. They just overlap them and share electrons in order to make the bond. Sorry, I can't talk to you. <clears throat> so that's where the valence bond theory comes from. And there's a model that goes with it called the localized electron model. Uh, in this model, a molecule is made up of atoms that are bound together by sharing pairs of electrons using their atomic orbitals only. And this is um, this is a quantum mechanical model. Well, it is to a certain extent a quantum mechanical model because the quantum mechanical model of the atom tells you which ones of the orbitals will overlap. That's as far as it goes. All right. So when we consider the localized electron model, localized means that the electrons still belong to each of the atoms. They're only sharing them in their atomic orbital overlaps. Um, and you can have two types of electrons. You can have those that are part of the bond itself. And remember, each one of those lines means a pair. That's a bonding pair. So a single bond is a, a one bonding pair, a double bond is two bonding pairs, and triples three bonding pairs. And then you can have some electrons that aren't part of the bond, right? They're lone pairs, right? When you form a molecule from the atoms, you can't create or destroy any electrons. You got to find a place for everybody. Some of them go into the bond. Some of them are lone pairs. Right. Uh, it'll. It's easier to understand when we use examples. Okay. Okay, so um, this item number two and item number three, we're going to cover today. The localized electron model is has with it uh, another model that helps us understand the geometry of the mo molecules and predict the geometry of the molecules. So we're going to combine the um, the valence electron arrangements in our atoms. We're going to learn how to do that. 
which was uh, a method proposed by G.N. Lewis. And then we're going to use that information to predict the geometry. That's the VSEPR model. And then the other, beyond that, we're going to hold for chapter nine. So um, what we're, we're discussing for the rest of this chapter is very useful in understanding how molecules are formed and how bonds hold them together and the shapes that they occupy and then the, the uh, polarity of the molecule itself, or even regions of a molecule can be polar and other regions can be nonpolar. And that's what the uh, localized electron model and the VSEPR model help us to do. What it doesn't do, what the, the, local, the valence electron uh, theory and the localized electron model with the VSEPR model does not do is it doesn't tell us anything about the energies. We cannot predict energies with these models. And that's where we're going in chapter nine with the um, uh, molecular orbital model. Right. But you don't have to worry about that one until next chapter. All right. <clears throat> At the beginning of the 20th century, Gian Lewis was, um, uh, I mean, calling him brilliant is an understatement. Uh, he was describing the covalent bond, and he was trying to figure a way to uh, simplify the drawing of molecules. And he hit upon this prospect of using the octet to help draw molecules uh, and account for all the electrons, where the valence electrons were going. So Lewis's model only incorporates valence electrons. We just need to know the valence electrons for the atoms. Then we can put them together into uh, covalent molecules. Come on. And... Uh, most of the time we'll be interested in the octet rule, but whenever there's hydrogen involved, it's the duet rule because hydrogen only has access to one S orbitals, which means two electrons and that's it. No more for hydrogen. But the others will, be, will respond to the duet rule, uh, excuse me, the octet rule, like fluorine, okay? So here's an example we represent with a single bond between two hydrogen atoms. Then uh, a covalent double bond between the carbon in one oxygen and the carbon in the other oxygen. And then nitrogen has a triple bond. In order to use uh, Lewis's uh, drawing method, what we have to do is we have to know that the compound is a given formula. So we would have to say something like, um, I don't know, make something up. Um, ammonia, how about that? We know that exists. And we know that that is the ratio, molar ratio of hydrogens to nitrogens. Then what we do is we uh, add up all the valence electrons that are allowed here. So nitrogen is in the... Uh, one, two, three, four, fifth position from the left in the periodic table. That means it has five valence electrons. Now it has more than that total, right? It has uh, seven, actually seven valence, it has seven total electrons, but we only want the valence electrons. There are five of them. And hydrogen only has one. So three times one is eight, Five plus three equals eight electrons, okay? So now what we do is we, we have to decide which one is the central atom, which one is at the, the core, and everybody else is attached to it. And this is for only simple molecules, right? That's where we're starting. In this case, you take the more electronegative atom and put it in the center, and that would be nitrogen. 
right? And then you attach the other atoms with a single bond. Okay? Then you count up the electrons that you've used. Two, four, six. Right? Each line is two electrons. So we subtract six. And we have two electrons left over. Where do you put them? Well, you can't form any more bonds because hydrogen can't take it. Hydrogen can only have two electrons in its 1s orbital. So hydrogen is stuck. It's a duet, duet, duet. So the two extra electrons we have go around the central atom, and you work your way from the outside in. Right? So if you have extra electrons, you say, can I put any on this one or this one or this one? No. So you move in. They have to go on nitrogen. And then, after you've used up all your electrons, then you say, uh, do all the hydrogens have their duet, and do all the other atoms have their octets? So you say, two, four, six, eight. Nitrogen has an octet. Two, four, two, two. Hydrogen has its duet. So we've used up all our electrons, and we put them where they're supposed to be. This is what's called a Lewis dot structure or simply a Lewis structure. Now, the example that's in the slides is for water. Right? In this case, we would add two electrons for the hydrogens, six for the oxygens, six valence electrons. We have eight electrons again. Right? Now we have oxygen in the middle. It's more electronegative. Plus, you can't put hydrogen in the middle because it can only have one bond. And you draw the, uh, you use two pairs, two for one hydrogen, two for the other. That uses up four electrons. All right, so now we have, there we go. We have two unused pairs, and they have to go on the oxygen. So now the oxygen has its octet, hydrogens have their duet. We've used up all the electrons. Right. That was water as our example. Now we could do the same thing for uh, phosphorus tribromide. Or we could do the same thing. Let's do um, hydros, um, yeah, hydrogen cyanide. Hydrogen cyanide. Okay. This has five valence electrons that have four, and this has one. So we have 10, 10 electrons. Now, which one goes in the middle? Well, um, actually, I said the more electronegative goes in the middle. Actually, in these cases, uh, for water and for ammonia, nitrogen goes in the middle because hydrogen can't. But when you have, have to make a choice, then we, we take the one to the left, the left and down, if necessary. So the one to the left is carbon. Carbon goes in the middle. And what we're trying to do is we put the more metallic one the one that's closer to the metals in the middle. So we got nitrogen here and hydrogen here. We've used up four. That means we have six electrons left. Okay, where do they go? Well, we start from the outside in. The outside is nitrogen. Two, four, six. So that's two, four, six, eight. Nitrogen has an octet. Carbon doesn't. So how do we form an octet for carbon without robbing nitrogen of its octet? Well, we take this one. Make a bond. This one, make a bond. Now we have this, that, and this. Is, we've used up all our um, two, four, six, eight, ten, ten electrons. Now we've got three bonds between the carbon and nitrogen, and we still have this lone pair. So two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight, and two. Okay. So that would be a valid Lewis dot structure for. Hydrogen cyanide. All right. No. All right. Let's see. Uh, I'm not going to spend time drawing these. 
They're too easy. Let's let's find one that's a little more difficult. Uh, we've done ammonia. Carbon dioxide. How about carbon dioxide? We know this is the balanced formula for carbon dioxide. Carbon has four electrons. Oxygen has six times two is 12, which equals 16 electrons. Okay. So carbon goes in the middle because it's to the left of oxygen. And then we form a bond like that. And that's used up four. So we have 12 electrons left. Two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve. Octet here, octet here, but not for carbon. So to balance, the best way is to do this and this. And that means oxygen would have two lone pairs with a double bond to carbon, and this one would have two lone pairs. And that's two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight, two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen electrons. That would be a valid Lewis dot structure. Now, for argument's sake, we could have done this. Uh, like that. But for reasons I'm going to explain eventually, this is not the best structure. This is the better structure. All right. Now there are exceptions. And that the exceptions are why I had to say in the very beginning, these compounds must exist. We have to know that they exist because if they exist, then our procedures, our theory has to explain why they exist, right? Rather than the other way around, we theorize and then we create these compounds out of thin air. No, the compounds exist first. So this boron trihydride does exist. We have three electrons here, and boron is three electrons, so we have six electrons. And boron in the middle, and we have three hydrogens, and like that, two, four, six. Used them all up. We got duets for hydrogens, but we only have six electrons for boron. That means boron is deficient. It does not have an octet, but it exists. So that's the best we can do. That's boron trihydride. We can also exceed the octet, right? Here are two examples. Right? If we drew um, sulfur tetrafluoride, we would find out that that central sulfur, in order to accommodate all the valence electrons, that central sulfur has to have two, four, six, eight, ten. Has to have ten electrons on it. And the, the arsenic in arsenic pentabromide has to have ten in the bonds around it. Now, how do we account for those? Well, sulfur, right, sulfur is here, and it's in the third period. Right, so sulfur has, uh, let's see, 16? 16. So 1s2, 2s2, 2p, uh, 6, 3s2, and 3p. Let's see, 2, 4, 10, 12, 4. Notice that <laughs> we don't have any electrons in the d orbitals, but we are accessing the third period, which also has available to it. 3D orbitals. So the 3D is where those two electrons go. They go into the 3Ds. And that's what you find. If you've got um, third period elements in these types of compounds, they have access, they can exceed the octet. And arsenic similarly, um, actually arsenic's already got a full 3D, so we have to go to 4D for arsenic. 
but the d orbitals answer this question. The boron trihydride is a little more difficult to deal with. All right. Now this one, boron trifluoride. Right, boron is uh, three valence electrons. Fluorine is a halogen as seven. So three times seven is 21. That means we have 24 electrons. So we put boron in the middle. We put the fluorines out here. Two, four, six. So it's 18 electrons left over. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. Now, when you have electrons available, unused pairs, then it's, it's advisable to try to make the octet. So if we take these two and do that, now boron has an octet and all the fluorines have an octet. But who's to say that we couldn't do this? Yeah, put the double band on that one. No reason why we can't. And of course, we could do the same thing for this one. With the uh, lone pairs here. Right. That's one of the faults of the Lewis structure model. Because these are all valid Lewis dot structures. So what we had to do in order to reconcile this problem, we had to modify the model with a, a uh, and it's gonna come in another slide, but I'm gonna give it to you now. We had to come up with an idea called resonance. All three of these are valid Lewis dot structures. Since we don't know which one is actually the one, we say they resonate among themselves, right? It's a resonance among all three of these. And we know that's true. Uh, well, we know that we have to do something about it because of the bond lengths. The bond lengths of each one of these bond, uh, boron fluoride bonds are exactly the same length. So that means they have to be the same bond nature. Right. This one can't be a short bond and these too long. Short bond too long. So we introduced resonance. If we drew the model like, like this, and I've seen it done this way, fluorine, fluorine, fluorine. And then we say like that, right. we're saying that they're all equal bonds. They're not quite single and they're not quite double. Okay, so... That's one of the fixes that we had to apply in order to accommodate these valid structures. Right, there's phosphorus uh, pentachloride and there's sulfur hexafluoride, right? And the, the PCL5 and the SF6 uh, all require that the central atom exceeds the octet. Um, okay, so we can also say that um, elements in the uh, second period from carbon, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, they will always obey the octet rule. Boron sometimes will be deficient. And beryllium also. Beryllium can be very deficient. Right? Instead of Missing two, it can miss, miss four electrons. Uh, second row elements never exceed the octet. But sometimes they're deficient. Third row and heaviers can exceed the octet and make use of d orbitals in order to do that. Try to, try to establish the octet wherever possible. And then if you have leftovers, 
they will go on the central atom as long as the central atom is period three or greater because then it has access to d orbitals. And here's the idea of resonance. In this case, rather than boron trifluoride, this one is um, the nitrate ion, right? The polyatomic ion nitrate. We use resonance because we end up with the same situation. Where does the double bond go? The difference when this one, uh, between that resonance and this resonance is, this is a neutral compound, whereas the nitrate is charged. So when you draw the structures for Lewis dot structures, if, if you have things like this polyatomic ion or this polyatomic ion or this polyatomic ion and you draw the Lewis structure, be sure that you surround your structure and give the charge. If you don't give the charge, then you're robbing it of those three electrons. Okay. They have to be added in. You add up the valence electrons for each one of the atoms, and then you add the charge. Okay. Um, so another term that comes up when we say resonance, we're resonating between the structures. What we're actually doing is delocalizing the electron density. Delocalized electrons. Which is kind of a kind of a cheat because the whole idea behind the uh, valence electron model and the localized uh, the valence electron theory and the localized electron model is that these electrons belong to each atom. But now we're delocalizing them in order to accommodate the, the reality. <clears throat> so, um, we can draw structures for each one of these. The methanol, uh, let's see, we've had very simple structures so far with only one central atom. When you get to uh, methanol, let's do that one because we're getting a little more complicated. And we have to learn what to do, and that you can have more than one geometry, more than one Lewis, uh, valid Lewis structure around different central atoms. So when we say CH3OH, methanol, we still start with the number of valence electrons. So carbon has four. We got four hydrogens, which is four more, and then oxygen has six, right? So we have 14 valence electrons. All right, now which one goes central? Well, we know that the hydrogens can't go in the middle. So we have to put carbon here. And if we bond the carbon to a hydrogen on this side, right, we got these hydrogens here, then we're stuck because hydrogen can't add anymore. So we have to go to oxygen. And then we go to the other hydrogen. So now we've used two, four, six, eight, ten. We have four electrons to go. They can't go on the hydrogens. So moving from outside in, carbon's already got uh, an octet. So the oxygen will have to take these four electrons. And that will give us a duet here, an octet there, an octet there, and duets there. So this would be our valid Lewis dot structure for methanol. All right. Now, I mentioned earlier, when we were trying to, uh, I mentioned that this is the best structure for carbon dioxide. Not this one. That. And here's how you decide. It's with a technique called formal charge. Now, formal charge is like, um, let's see. I have to scratch my head. Have we done? Um, my mind's gone blank. Let me look at the, the series here.
Maybe that's in one or two. Yeah, we get it one or two. Okay, so um, I won't introduce that topic. Let's just talk about formal charge. What do we mean by formal charge? Well, we know what a charge is on an ion. Right, how it forms. We transfer electrons from one species to another, makes one of them deficient, makes the other one excess in negative charge. Those are actual charges. Formal charge is a bookkeeping scheme. It doesn't say that there's a charge on any one of these atoms. It just says that uh, we're tracking the electron movement with formal charge. And the way we do it is um, we take the, um, the Lewis dot structure and they would say, how many valence electrons are, are uh, originally on each one of these atoms, right? Carbon valence electrons would be six. And I uh, mean, oxygen would be six and carbon would be four. Then we count the number of electrons that can be assigned to each one of the atoms. And if there's a bond, we only take half, right? So this would be one for that one and one for this one. So it'd be one, two, three, four, five, six. And we subtract that from the uh, free atom uh, valence electrons. That would be zero, okay? Carbon now is one, two, three, four. Out of those four bonds, four electrons, that's a zero, and same for this side. Okay, if we do the same thing over here, then this carbon, let's see, four, six, six. This carbon has one, two, three, four, that's four, that's zero. This oxygen has one, two, three, four, five. It's five, so that's a plus one. And this side has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Minus seven, minus one. The formal charge on that oxygen is minus one. The formal charge on this one is plus one. What you want <clears throat> for the best, uh, the tiebreaker, is the lowest possible formal charge for all of your elements, for all the atoms. And this one is the best. Zero, zero, zero is better than plus one, zero, minus one. So this one wins. And that would be the uh, preferred Lewis dot structure. Now you can do this for, for any size molecule you want. It just becomes more difficult with more atoms. And I emphasize that this is not an actual charge. This is a bookkeeping scheme. And it's used, it's used more for organic chemistry than it is for general chemistry. Okay, there's the formula, right? And that just tells you what we just did with that example. All right. Assign the formal charge for each one of these. Now let me see, is it going to be animated? Yeah. So the phosphorus has five valence electrons in the free atom. And how many are around phosphorus now? Right. We got four single bonds. Half of those would be four electrons. So five minus four is a plus one. Phosphorus has a plus one formal charge. If we do the chlorines, uh, let's do the oxygen next. Oxygen is six, but it has seven electrons around the oxygen. All right, so its formal charge is minus one. And then the chlorines would be seven minus seven is zero. Now, if you cannot uh, envision or create uh, a Lewis dot structure that has zero, 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 then this is the best one. And you have to go with that one. Now, when you add up all the formal charges, 
they must equal the overall charge of the molecule. If it's a neutral molecule, they have to all add to zero, which they did before. Zero, 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 or plus one, zero, minus one. They're all zeros. To do the same thing for nitrate, right? then the, the added formal charges must add up to the charge on the polyatomic ion. They have to add up to negative one. Or if we did for sulfate, it'd be negative two. If we did for phosphate, it'd be negative three. So we still have to uh, account for all the charges and not create or destroy. You know, where's my arrow? There we go. All right, we already did this one. Non-equivalent Lewis structures. That's what this example that I just gave you is. And we would we would go for the carbon with uh, two double bonds on it rather than the triple and a single. All right, this is just cautionary words for the use of the formal charge. These are estimates. These are bookkeeping schemes. They're not actual atomic charges. And um, it's, it's entirely possible that, especially with the more complex molecules, that you can use formal charge and come up with the wrong answer. You can, uh, erroneous predictions. Uh, formal charge is a way to help you avoid those types of uh, misinterpretations. The only absolute way to determine uh, the, whether the Lewis structure is correct is to get physical evidence. Right? Measure the bond lengths, measure the strengths, those types of things will then tell you uh, whether you've made a boo-boo or not. All right. Now that we know how to draw a Lewis dot structure and pick the, the best one, we're going to use the Lewis dot structure to predict the geometry of a molecule <clears throat> using the VSEPR model. VSEPR stands for valence shell electron pair repulsion. VSEPR. We're going to predict the geometry of a molecule. And these are regular geometries. And then we're going to take the regular geometries and tweak them a little bit to match reality. The whole, the basic idea behind the VSEPR model is once you've got the Lewis dot structure, you want to minimize the repulsive forces among the electron groups. And that's where those regular uh, geometric shapes come in handy. Now, uh, this last statement is true for large molecules. Large molecules can have several centers of geometry. And some centers will be tetrahedral, others might be bent, uh, some will be trigonal planar in the same molecule, but you need larger molecules in order to get that to happen. All right. So we can also say something about the bond angles. So what is a bond angle? Well, if you have a, a central atom and then you have one here and say one here, like that, and there, there could be other things up here. The bond angle is that right there, right? With the central atom at the apex, right? So the angle is between this bond and that bond. So if you have something like this, what's the bond angle? 180 degrees. It's linear. Okay. If we have a trigonal planar like uh, boron trihydride,
what's the bond angle, right? Well, we know that 360 degrees is all the way around, right? We got to evenly divide it among three. So each bond angle is 120 degrees. Three times 120 is 360. Tetrahedral is a little diff more difficult to wrap your head around because it's this is planar, this is planar. Tetrahedral is three dimensional. So just memorize this one. If you have a tetrahedron like uh, methane, you've got a hydrogen up here, hydrogen down here, here, and you got one in the back. So we have this tetrahedral structure, and these are the bonds. So how about the bond with this as the apex right here to here? It's 109.5 degrees. That's the internal bond angle of a tetrahedral structure. Well, that's our starting point. There are several more. We're going to get to them in, in just a minute. But those are the first three that we've discussed. So in order to use the model, we have to draw, we have to, first of all, we have to know that the compound exists. Then we have to draw. And then we identify the central atom and how many groups surround that atom. And so our example here, one, two, three, we have three groups. Your textbook may call them pairs, three pairs. And in this case, it's true, pair, pair, pair. But if we have something like, uh, oh, this one, right? And this one only has two. We have three groups, right? We have two, four, six, eight. We have four pairs, but we only have three groups, right? So we still have three groups for each one of those. So we count double bonds and triple bonds as a single entity. It only gets one vote. One vote, one vote, one vote. We don't play favorites with double and triple bonds. So that's what you do first. Find your central atom and how many surround it. Now for something like... Um, well, what was our example? Uh, sulfur hexafluoride. What? We had sulfur, one, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah, I think that does. Let's see, 642 and six is 48 electrons. And if we put an octet around each one of these, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, 48 electrons. Okay. So this would be that one. This would have one, two, three, four, five, six groups around the sulfur. It exceeds the octet, but it's a real compound. Right? So when we draw the structure, we have six groups around that central atom. Now we have to say, all right, what regular structure gives us six groups around it? And I'll talk about that in a minute. <laughs> right? If we draw uh, hydrogen cyanide like we did before, it has to be linear. Right? It only has two groups around the carbon. Right? Phosphorus trihydride only has three hydrogens around its center. It's trigonal. No. Excuse me. Um, phosphorus trihydride Oops. Phosphorus trihydride. Right. Phosphorus is five and three is eight. Right. Two, four, six, eight. So it has one, two, three, four groups. Right. So four groups means tetrahedral. We have the phosphorus in the center. We have a lone pair up there. We have a hydrogen in the back. We have a hydrogen out here and hydrogen out here. And if we draw in the imaginary tetrahedral structure, 
like that, what we get is a tetrahedral electronic. I'm sort of getting ahead of myself here. Tetrahedral electronic structure. But the molecular structure doesn't include these because there's no atom there. Uh, so when you're actually looking at the, the uh, bonding and the structure, you've got a trigonal pyramid. So the uh, trigonal pyramid is the molecular structure. Okay? We're going to more detail about that one in a minute. Similarly, if we do SF4, um, we get a molecular structure that's not a, not a regular structure. We have lone pairs in there that have to be accounted for. Okay, so we're going to do that uh, in a minute. Um, let's skip that for now. Okay, so a question. A molecule that has polar bonds will always be polar. True or false? False. Right. If they are equivalent polar bonds pointing in to the uh, apexes of a regular structure, like these are all equal, right? These are polar bonds, but they're pointing to regular apexes of a structure, they cancel one another out. So boron trifluoride should be nonpolar. Okay, uh, let's see. Carbon dioxide, we drew that already. It contains polar bonds, yes, but overall it's nonpolar. True or false? Lone pairs make a molecule polar. Not necessarily. All depends on the structure. Okay, xenon tetrafluoride. I need to look at my hard copy. I'm, I'm starting to wander. Not remembering what's coming next. Uh, let's save xenon tetrafluoride till later. And let's look at let me let me build a table. Let's do that. I think this will make more sense. Let's build a table. And let's put in that table uh, the number, the number of uh, electron pairs or electron groups. I like groups better. Because that way we can include doubles and triples. Number of electron groups. And then the electronic. Um, geometry, right? And then the uh, molecular geometry. And then we can maybe think of a few examples. Okay. So if you have, well, if you only have one group, there's no other possibility, right? It's, if it's if it's by it, if it's uh, diatomic, the linear is the only possibility. And so we're not going to put that one in there. But if we have uh, if we have two electron groups, right, the electronic geometry is going to be uh, linear. All right. If we have Three, let's see, let's put three, three electron groups, we're going to have trigonal planar. Okay, if we have four, now we're still talking about only the electronic geometry. If we have four groups and they don't have to be bonding, then we have tetrahedral. Oh, I forgot to put in bond angles. Uh, let me move this down. 
uh, molecular geometry and bond angles. Right. Bond angle for linear is 180 degrees. Trigonal planar is 120 degrees. Tetrahedral is 109.5 degrees. Now, if we have five groups, what's the best regular structure for that? It's a, it's a trigonal bipyramid. And so it would be something like this. You would have a, a trigonal central, and then you would have something up here, something down here. So if you drew, if you drew in the imaginary trigonal pyramid here, then you'd have another trigonal pyramid down here. So it's like two trigonal pyramids with their bases together. That gives you a position for five. One, two, three, four, five, with a central atom there on the central triangle. Right. And the bond angles here could be several. If all positions are occupied by atoms, then you can have a bond angle here going from here to here, right, like that, is 90 degrees. Then you can go from here to here, would be 180 degrees. And then if you went from here to here, from this atom, say to this atom, then that would be 120 degrees. So you have those three possibilities if all the positions have atoms. And then the last one I'm going to introduce is six groups, and this would be hexagonal. And it's just like this one, only now you have a square in the center. And then you have positions up there with that central atom. For this one, the angles you can have, you can still have 90 degrees, and you can have 180 degrees, right? For this angle here, and this angle here, 90 degrees, but for each one of these, they're all 90 degrees also. Oh, I'm sorry. You're right. I don't know what I was thinking of. Thank you. Octahedral, three dimensional shapes. The hedron means surface. How many surfaces? That eight surfaces. So it has a surface here, surface there, surface there, surface there on top. That's four, and then four more on the bottom. So that's eight surfaces. This one has, well, it's one, two, three, four, five, six. And this one actually has six surfaces, but we call it a trigonal bipyramid. I'm not sure six surfaces in geometry would be hexahedron. Yeah, hexahedron. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so these are the electronic geometries. Now, <clears throat> if, um, if you've got two groups and one of them's missing and you have a, 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 an electron pair on one side, you still have linear. So it's always going to be linear no matter what. And the best example of that is, is carbon dioxide. Okay. Trigonal planar would be something like, um, let's see, um, boron trifluoride would be trigonal planar. Right. And its molecular geometry would also be trigonal planar. I'm trying to think of an example where one of these is missing. Right, You have a free electron pair. In that case, you'd have a bent molecule. If you have, uh, and this would be um, uh, one pair. Let's see, in here you would have uh, lone pairs, lone pairs. Right here. So if it's one lone pair, you'd have a bent molecule. I can't think of an example right now. Um, and of course, if you had two lone pairs, then it would be linear again. So I'm not gonna put that one up there. Tetrahedral, 
If they're all occupied, of course, you're going to have tetrahedral. And that would be something like carbon tetrafluoride. That would be tetrahedral. If you had one pair, then you would have a, a trigonal pyramid. And the best example of that is ammonia, which is like this. But, and then you have hydrogen back here, hydrogen over here, hydrogen over here, with a trigonal base. So it, it's a trigonal pyramid. And if you have two lone pair, uh, then you would have a bent molecule. The best example of that is water. Water then would be um, oxygen here, hydrogen there, hydrogen there, and two lone pairs here. All right, so you have, you have one, two, three, four groups that gives you an electronic tetrahedron, but if you're only considering the, the atoms, you're bent. Right? Because you'd have a like a high oxygen here and you have a hydrogen here and hydrogen here, that'd be a lone pair, that'd be a lone pair. So you have bent. Okay. Uh, we get a little more complicated here. Uh, if we have one lone pair, the question is, where does the lone pair go here? Well, as it turns out, and this is from experimentation, the lone pair, if you're, if you're missing one here, the lone pair goes on the triangle. So now you've got, you got a bond here, you got a bond here, bond there and bond there. If you turn it on its side, right, X in the middle, you get a seesaw. So one lone pair gives you a seesaw. All right, let's see, do I have examples? Uh, no, it doesn't give me examples. If we have two lone pairs, it also goes on the triangle. In that case, we have a T-shape. Two pair is a T-shape. And then if you have three pairs, it's linear. Because they all go on the central triangle. Okay? I can't think of good examples right now. Uh... Uh, your textbook probably has several. Okay. For the octahedral, it's a little bit different. When you have a lone pair with the octahedral, physical evidence tells us that the lone pair is not on the square. The lone pair would be up here on one of the apexes. So in that case, you would have a uh, square pyramid. You know, like the Pyramid of Giza in Egypt. And if you have two of pairs, it goes on the other apex, and that gives you square planar. Square. Yeah. Square planar. Okay. And then if you have another lone pair, it goes here. And now you're back to uh, this way, this way, this way, and that would be, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, that would be a T-shape. No, it wouldn't, it'd be a seesaw, excuse me, seesaw, All right? All right, go over okay, here, there, there, yeah, seesaw, sorry. You'd have to have four lone pairs to get a T-shape if the uh, electronic structure is, is tetrahedral. Okay. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. So I'm going to have to erase this to make room. Okay. I, I think it's easier to understand when I put it in a table like that. All 
All right. <clears throat> so when phosphorus reacts with excess chlorine gas, the compound phosphorus pentachloride is formed. In the gaseous and the liquid states, this substance consists of PCL5 molecules, but in the solid state, it has a, a mixture of PCL4 pluses and PCL6 minus ions. So we're looking at the geometric structures for each one of those, right? In the liquid and the gaseous state, PCL5 only, which would look like a trigonal bipyramid like that, okay, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So phosphorus would exceed the octet and give you a trigonal bipyramid, molecular structure, because there are no long pairs around phosphorus. And then if we go to the solid state and we say PCL4, uh, count up the electrons, draw the structure, and then don't forget the charge, and we find that in this case, phosphorus has its octet. And we have a tetrahedral structure for a PCL4+. Plus. And the PCL6- minus has 48 electrons. If we draw its structure, the phosphorus has 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 electrons. Around, around it, uh, it exceeds the octet. And that's an octahedral structure. So we have a mixture of tetrahedral and octahedral in the solid state. Um, for the longest time, the noble gases were considered unreactive, completely unreactive. And then in the 60s, um, I'm sure a graduate student would task with the with the possibility of, of making compounds with these oil gases and uh, succeeded, not with the smaller ones. But once you get the krypton and xenon, now you've got uh, a lot more space and these electrons are further from the nucleus, they're shielded from the nucleus, they're more reactive. All right, so krypton, xenon and radon, uh, I, I wouldn't mess with radon because it's radioactive. Right, but krypton and xenon are okay. Uh, and uh, various compounds were created. One of those was xenon tetrafluoride. So what's its structure? Well, uh, xenon has eight valence electrons. Fluorine has seven each, so that's 28 plus eight is 36, right? 36 electrons. And if we draw the Lewis dot structure, that means... Xenon exceeds the octet by four electrons. So what would that be? Electronic structure would be um, octahedral, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Six around xenon means octahedral electronic. And then if we position those lone pairs at the apex of the octahedron, what's left in the center is square planar. So we're actually looking at square planar for the geometric um, molecular structure. Now, what this slide does, it, it proposes the difference. If we put those two lone pairs on the square, then we get a seesaw. If we, uh, let's see. Did I do that? I did that with... Uh, one, two. No, I only did that when. Okay. So my octahedral to part of the table is wrong. Let me correct that. We have six pair. Then you have octahedral. Electronic structure. And molecular structure, of course, is going to be the same if all the positions are occupied, and so octahedral. If we have one lone pair, then we're going to have right, like this. One lone pair is going to be up here. So it's a square pyramid. I did that one right, I believe. Square pyramid. If we have two lone pairs, 
I think I did this one right also. We have square plane. Square plane. Okay. Then if we have another long pair, that gives us That is a T-shape, isn't it? Right, one, two, three. Yeah, it is a T-shape, three pairs of T-shape. And then if we have um, <clears throat> another lone pair out here, then that's bent. So four pair would be bent. There we go. That's the correct arrangement for <laughs> This is lone. Lone one pair, two pair, three pair, four octahedral. All right. So what this slide is doing is saying, okay, we're proposing where those two lone pairs would go. Right. If we put them on the um, square, then we would have a seesaw. If we put them at the apexes, we have a square planar. All right, so how do we tell the difference? Well, we need physical evidence. In the structure, the, the uh, structure A, right there, uh, the lone pairs are on the square. So we have what possibility of bonds do we have? All right, we have 180 and 90 degrees. That's it. All right, we could have both, 180 and 90 degrees. But if the lone pairs are at the apex, the only possibility is 90 degree bond angle. Now, if we, if we look at the space they need, right, those lone pairs, what we have is we've trying to position everything as far apart as possible. One thing about uh, lone pairs is they tend to, let's use our example here. Say we have um, xenon in the middle, and we have something here, 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 and here. And we have a lone pair there, a lone pair there. What those lone pairs do, because they are not confined in a bond, they tend to balloon out. So putting them at the apex would give them more room. Right? That's the logical approach. Uh, I thought we were going to get physical evidence. Um, oh, polarity of the molecule. Right? Polarity of this molecule, right? if we have fluorines out here, like that, right? xenon tetrafluoride is the molecule, then this means that the molecule is nonpolar. So we can test that. But if we put the lone pairs out here, and put the fluorines up here, that unbalances the molecule and makes it polar. So we just test the polarity and we find that this molecule is nonpolar. Right? So the only possibility is the square planar that, that answers all those questions. All right. I know I took a long time to do that, but there it is. <laughs> okay. So we're done for today, and what we'll do on Thursday is start the review and go through probably half of the review and then finish up the other half on the next Tuesday before. Oh, I didn't talk about the, the lab. Um, let me see if there's anything about the lab that would help you. Talking about pre-lab questions. Do we have any post-lab questions? Yeah, there are post-lab questions too. You want me to do that? You want to talk about the lab? Have a, Patricia, are you still there? Probably taking care of the kids. She's got a sick kid. I'll tell you what. Um, set up your notebook. Uh, using this, 
And then you may have some questions and we'll deal with them. Um, Either Thursday or uh, the next Tuesday before the lab. Because if, if I if I cover more than half of it on Thursday, then we should have time before the, the lab to talk about it. And the nice thing about that is it'll be fresh and everybody will be here in person. They can ask questions. So we'll do it that way. Otherwise, we're done for today. <laughs>